Good evening, people of the Philippines. Good morning. Good afternoon, people of the world. Welcome to another exciting episode of the English Blog, a blog of English teachers by English teachers and for English teachers. My name is Adrian. I'm Christine. I'm TJ. I'm Sarah. And today is、um, season two, episode seven, where we will be talking about English accent and pronunciation training for your ESL students. So be sure to to watch our episode and see what insights you can gain from this episode. Don't forget that we provide customized lesson plan making services, curriculum planning. We also have a resident. Life and career coach. If you're interested in availing of some sessions, and we produce weekly vlog and blog content related to ESL education. If you are interested in our services, please do send us a message at www.theenglishblog.com, and don't forget to subscribe to our website to make sure you get some interesting offers and updates. You can also find us everywhere. On social media, we're on Facebook as the English Blog at the URL the English Blog for Teachers. We're also on Instagram the underscore English Blog.、Uh, we're also on LinkedIn as a company, the English Blog.、Uh, you can watch the videos on Facebook or on YouTube, where we are the English Vlog with a V. That's how you find us on YouTube. And lastly, we are on Twitter, the English Blog One. You can find blog posts, videos. Quotes, all sorts of everything, all over social media. So don't forget to like, follow, share, subscribe, and find us however you want. Okay, so talking about liking and sharing, as you guys watch us today, don't forget to share this video. Whether you're watching on your phone, on your tablet, laptop, or your PC, share it because sharing is caring. First question is. Where do accents come from? So maybe I'd like to start this with something that's historical, and、uh, also people believe that this is also biblical. Maybe let's start with where did、um, language come from, right? So most of most of us have been、um, acquainted with the story of the Tower of Babel, wherein people started building. A, A really tall tower to get to God and to make a name for themselves, and then God、uh, interrupted that plan and scattered to different parts of the world. Now, in terms of accent, let's first define what accent is. Accent is actually a distinctive way of pronouncing something that is affected by geographical location and culture. So, accents come from where we come from. And that is、uh, that has evolved through time, as the language evolved too. Yep, that is exactly right. And everybody has an accent, and you just don't hear it when you're around people with the same accent.、Um, in the actual pronunciation of English and the way we speak, accent is built by four main things. So one is the actual sounds, how you pronounce each consonant and each vowel sound.、Um, the other one is what we call rhythm, which is how you stress words and where the stress lies in an entire sentence, which varies among languages.、Um, intonation, so the way that you change your voice to make it a question, how you show your mood through how you're speaking, and then also phrasing. Your correct word order and English phrasing will make you seem like you have a better accent. Although it has really nothing to do with pronunciation, but that's kind of the last phase. You need to get the other three best before you really start worrying about getting the, the word in the exact right order. For most adults, their accent in English comes from L1 transfer or L1 interference.、Um, so what? You you get a foreign accent by pronouncing English words and speaking English as if it were your native language.、Um, and sometimes there are sounds that exist in your language that don't exist in English, and vice versa. That can trip you up.、Um, the stress can be very different between each language. So yeah, you really have to watch out and get your brain going into English mode and start learning it. Away from your L one. 
English. What does it mean to have a good or bad accent? Right. So I think that if we look at the common definition of what communication is, most of us have heard the definition, the definition that the message intended was the message that was received. So that's a working definition for communication. So I think that what it means to have a good accent in English is for people to be able to understand um, at least most or the essence of what you are trying to communicate. And um, I would say, I don't like the word bad accent. I would say a developing or a, le a learning accent is one um, where uh, some of the words that, uh, uh, that a student is saying is garbled or not easily distinguished as the word for which the student is trying to communicate. So those I think are some yardsticks for us to begin to define what might be a good accent and what might be a problematic accent for an English language learner. Christine? Yeah, I'm also not sure if I like the term bad accent or even good accent. I, I, I think I prefer good pronunciation or bad pronunciation. And pronunciation means your ability to speak in a way that is intelligible to speakers, to other speakers of the English language. And as long as other speakers, especially native speakers, can understand you, then I think you have good pronunciation of the English language. And I will go into more detail. We will go into more detail on how to improve your pronunciation or accent for that matter. Um, and some ways that I can think of are listen and repeat exercises, especially with the native speaker, um, being familiar with the IPA, which is the International Phonetic Alphabet. And that's considered the most reliable um, the oldest and most reliable guide to the Latin alphabet. Um, but again, I'll go into that in more detail. But yeah, I think you want to focus more on improving your pronunciation. Okay. And talking about good accent, how important is a good accent for proficiency? Do students need a perfect accent? I think that focused study on accents should be limited personally to students who are at are at the B1 level or above. Um, I personally think that if you want to improve your accent or pronunciation um, and you are a beginner level student, you should focus first on the basics of the English language, um, focus on the rules of grammar and trying to expand your vocabulary. And then once you think that you've achieved a working level of proficiency in the English language, then you can start working on your pronunciation and um, how much you want to focus on your pronunciation, I think, depends on what you want to do with the English language. What are your goals? Do you want to, do you want people to look up to you? Because people tend to look up to people who have an, a general American accent or a neutralized accent. Is that what you're going for? Are you pursuing a career where you have to deal um, quite often with native English speakers? So it really depends on what you want to achieve. Um, and that should determine how much you want to focus on improving your accent and your pronunciation. Uh, I have a totally different answer. So if we can just throw the question back up there. Um, so I'm gonna go actually with the second question first, which is, do students need a perfect accent? No, absolutely not. Okay. Um, your aim as a teacher should be that it should be to aim that your students are easily understood. That is it. Okay, that is a good benchmark to aim for because um, one of the things that they're going to have to do in speaking a new language is they're going to have to move their mouths, their tongues, and their lips in a different way. So when we talk about, so that brings me to my, the next question, which is 
how important is good accent is a good accent for proficiency well um i don't i don't really agree with the relationship that is being presented here because one of the things that i've found is that dramatizing the the accent and the pronunciation while learning another language is part of what makes you remember the word what makes learning fun and it actually it actually you know it actually helps you get better at the language that you're trying to master so i would say that working on the pronunciation and working on the accent will help you develop your overall proficiency because um, of the nature of of the practice uh, it will it will it will solidify your your um, maybe remembering certain words and how to say them will also trigger other memories inside of you so it's actually it's worthwhile to put in the work of getting getting a, a neutral or a more uh, yeah, a, a more neutral English accent because there are other benefits to learning by doing that. Um, I know that's not a pat pat answer, but the relationships in learning are a, a little bit complicated and not always linear. All right, let's move on then. How can you help students develop a correct accent? Um, I just want to say coming from a non-native English teacher, I would say you would do better when you know better. And that means a lot of work on yourself as well as a non-native English speaker. Um, because if you don't know much about a particular topic when you're, when you're teaching accent and pronunciation, then you cannot give what you do not have, right? So you start, you got to start with yourself and having empathy with your students as well. Because if you're teaching another non-native English speaker, then you know where they are coming from because you were there in their shoes before. So uh, a big um, contribution to your way of teaching them is empathy, a lot of patience and understanding too. Yeah, I think empathy is a, is a good way. You should have empathy in order to teach your student correct pronunciation. I mean, um, if your student speaks a language that is completely different from the English language, I mean, some languages are not as rhythmic or they don't use the same intonation or the same word stress and sentence stress as the English language. And you should realize those differences between their native language and the English language. So yeah, I think you should definitely try to, I, I don't know if the word is empathize, but you should understand where they are coming from and how different their language and even their culture is from your language and your culture. Um, and you should be very, very patient with them. I think you also mentioned that um, sometimes that involves um, practicing pronunciation with them repetitively and doing it again and again. And if you are frustrated as a teacher, which is inevitable, it's going to happen, do not show your frustration. Um, instead, encourage the student and try to turn that frustration into positive energy, um, into motivation, and so that you can further help your student achieve the accent and pronunciation that they want. So um, I think one practical bit of advice that you can start off with uh, um, to get going on teaching your your students pronunciation is um, what I like to do is I really like to bring in a mirror. So I have um, if I have a budget at a school, I'll have the I'll have the school buy uh, many mirrors for every student. And then we will purposely practice words that are difficult for that student population. And First, I'll have them do it without the mirror. Then I'll have them do it their normal way with the mirror so they can see what they're doing. Then I tell them what to do with their mouth. So where to put their lips, where to put their tongue. And I, I show them first and then they, I have them do it 
in the mirror and then produce the sound again. This is super effective because they, can, they then can develop the motor memory to produce the sounds that their mouth is unfamiliar with. And this is something that they can even take home and practice, right? So, but before that, I suggest that you gather the common errors in your classroom so you can do that. And you can drill them as a group and then also drill them individually, okay? And then have them go home and practice that. Yeah, likewise to what PJ said, uh, when I teach pronunciation and accent, I do a lot of drilling and you should vary how you drill. You can drill in a giant group, drill in small groups, drill individually. Um, and don't ever skip pronunciation in your lesson. You might have to build it into your lesson plan. Make a note and say, we're gonna, we're gonna do this, we're gonna drill asking questions and they're gonna repeat and repeat and repeat until they get the intonation right. Um, and every time that you teach a word, make sure that you teach its pronunciation. And if it's particularly difficult, you might need to write on the board, you might have to mark some stresses, um, but don't forget to actually teach it. It's, it, it, it can be passively earned through osmosis, but it goes a lot quicker when you as the teacher make it a focused direct learning. Um, also related to what PJ mentioned is, yeah, I find the use of uh, using my own mouth as a model, but also like a little anatomical mouth. Um, and the charts, there are special charts, maybe I'll find a link and put it in the comments, to these charts that show you how to hold your lips and how to hold your tongue. And this became really important. Um, once upon a time, I taught a, a student who was partially deaf and was a native Spanish speaker. And so when your student cannot actually physically hear the different sounds that you're making, they're entirely dependent on the muscle memory, on learning where to put their mouth, how much air to put out to make that sound. But it can be done. You can, you can teach that person to have correct pronunciation, even if they can't hear exactly all of the all of the correct sounds that you're saying. Um, so yeah, use, I love the diagrams and don't forget to have them listen. If they're not hard of hearing, uh, they need to consume a lot of media outside of your classroom in order to get their accent better. You're not the only, the only player in this game. Talking about consuming a lot of media outside the classroom, I always tell my students, whether that learning Tagalog or learning English from me, that um, Malcolm Gladwell's um, idea, one big idea in the book, in one of his books, he said that it takes 10,000 hours to become an expert at something. So just imagine if you budget that time, you really need to do more than just in the classroom or in the learning sessions, right? Any other additional thoughts on this? Yeah, I do. So the idea of stress is also something you will have to teach to your students. So your, your students might not know linguistically what it means when you say stress. So you should take a common word, okay? Like a common one for Filipinos is category, right? So most native English speakers put the stress on the fourth syllable, <laughs> um, but Filipinos say category, category, right? So they put the stress on the second syllable. So another tip is for, for when you teach, you're not only teaching um, how to produce the individual sounds of the English alphabet, but also the whole word. So you cannot also skip talking about where the emphasis is on a word. And if to help you out, what I say is, what I usually have them do is I usually have them elongate the part that is stressed on purpose, right? 
So I'll have them go category or something like that. So it drills in their mind where the stress in the word falls. Um, or I'll tell them it's where you spend the most time. If you count the number of milliseconds, you would spend the most time there. Because the concept of stress, some of your students are going to have a hard time with that. So just be prepared. What are the best exercises for teaching correct pronunciation and accent? So let me share that I would like to put out this word first recording and when I say recording that means two things you can have them listen to a recording of for example in my case I'm a non-native English speaker I would make them listen to a recording of a native English speaker and then uh, have them do the exercises after that to mimic the sound that they're hearing and then another meaning that I want to say about recording is I also encourage my students to record themselves so that they will hear how they sound. And because most of us have smartphones nowadays, I would encourage them to record yourself, maybe talking about your day or whatever you want to talk about, and then you listen to yourself. And then you compare yourself to a native English speaker. How do you sound? Then um, some of the guys have already mentioned this earlier, modeling and uh, you do the demo, how do you actually do it? I also like to recommend that you encourage your students to watch Netflix with subtitles, always, so that they would know how to pronounce words properly because as they watch, they also see how it's spelled, right? So there. Stress, I, also, I agree that stress is very, very important when teaching students pronunciation. Um, and one activity that I like to do to teach students stress, um, if I'm teaching them how to do stress in three syllable words, I'll give them a, a long list of three syllable words. And then um, I have a table with three columns. Uh, the first table is stress in the first syllable. The second column is stress in the second syllable and so forth. And I have them put the words in the proper column and then I correct them as needed. And then I have them read out the words. And if they struggle, then I do some listening, listen and repeat exercises where I say the word and they repeat it after me. And kind of like what PJ said, what PJ suggested, I stress, I kind of exaggerate that one stress syllable and then encourage my student to do the same thing. And then I have them do that over and over again. And to make it more practical for them, I might make them write a story with as many of those words as they can and then have them read aloud the story. And if they make any mistakes, then I guide them as needed. Um, and then one way, if you wanna help them with intonation, not just stress, intonation, rhythm, um, everything, word stress, sentence stress, you can have them mark words and parts of the sentences with the pen or pencil. So with rising intonation, you can draw a line that's gradually moving upward or falling intonation, a, a line that's gradually moving downward. You can turn it into a dialogue. You can do the same thing with a dialogue and then have, the, have them read the dialogue with each other. So those are exercises that have proven to be helpful for me in my ESL classes. So what's really useful is drama. I mean, drama can teach a lot because, you know, you can actually, you can actually use dramatic techniques for how to speak in the in the real world. So, you know, you can you can be telling your students, okay, you gotta emphasize one word and in, in when you say this line, what are you gonna emphasize? Right? And then so doing the dramatic the doing the dramatic scene or do, doing those dramatic lines, they learn that, you know, what to uh, how to communicate the most important word in a sentence through doing something fun. So I, I, yeah, I, I agree with Christine that dialogue is a great way to do that for learning where, where to stress a word in a sentence. I don't know if you guys have heard of this exercise. You write a sentence often, it's pretty hilarious. Like, 
I didn't steal her wallet. And then you stress a different word each time. And then you ask the students, what does each version of the sentence mean? And that can right. be very hilarious and also very helpful for them to understand the importance of stress. So. That's true. I do that. All right, let's get to the next question. And the next question is, can I steal can I still teach proper English if I have a foreign accent? Uh, yes, you can definitely still teach someone to speak English correctly, even if you yourself have a foreign accent. Um, like we said earlier in the video, as long as you can communicate your ideas effectively, then you are speaking English just fine and you can teach English. Um, there, Getting, changing your accent is a lot of work that no matter, even if you're a native teacher like I am, you cannot give that student that native accent by just seeing them in class an hour every day. They really need to consume a lot of um, media, a lot of oral media uh, throughout the whole, over years in order to um, develop an accent. They really just have to listen, listen, listen. And also, I just want to point out, too, to remember that there is a lot of value in your students being exposed to a variety of accents, both native and non-native. There are plenty of people who learn English, but then they can only understand one subset of a native speaking group. And that isn't really that helpful when it's so widely spoken um, by a variety of people with a variety of different accents. doing this for many years already for as long as you know the concepts um, not just the theories but also the practical the practicalities of the English language and I agree with what Sarah mentioned earlier about exposing your students to many different kinds of accents because in the US alone they have so many different accents right the southern accent you have the New Yorker and you have from other parts of the US and also in other parts of the world so definitely expose them because their exposure to this uh, many different accents not just from the US but also from other parts of the world will actually give them an edge so that they're not culture shocked when they're talking to another non-native English speakers or even a native English speaker as well is there any way for adult learners to get a native like accent Yes, with a lot of work, a lot of patience, a lot of intentionality, you can. One thing you might want to tell your adult learners is to approach it like an acting class. You know, approach it like they're taking on a whole uh, other persona, you know. And then, because they're going to have to be really deliberate about mimicking that native-like accent. And it's going to feel... It's going to feel really, really unnatural at first. See, kids don't feel the uncomfortableness of the unnaturalness of it because they just love to experiment and try new things. But as, a, as adults, slowly, slowly, we get more scared of taking risks. But this is why great language learners take risks. They throw themselves 100% and commit 100% to mimicking that, that accent that they want. And they don't care if they sound like an idiot in the process. So that, that's, the, that's the formula right there, if you're an adult. And we're down to the last question. What is the best English accent, if there is even such a thing? What do you guys think? Um, you know, Every, every accent in English has a beauty of its own. And, and I, I would not say that there is one accent that's, that's better than another. Okay? I mean, some people would say that the English accent is sexy or seductive. The British accent is like that, you know, and the American or the Canadian accent is very cool and suave. You know, so there are definitely opinions about about what, but it what what is the best English accent? But it's really just a matter of taste. Uh, what you should be aiming for for 
yourself as an English learner or as a teacher for your students is just an accent where you can be easily understood by native and non-native English speakers alike. Yeah, I think that um, a lot of people tend to have a hierarchy for accents, like this is the best accent, and then this accent is not so acceptable. And I think Filipino people tend to put down their accent and think that it's not legitimate, and they try to adopt um, what they consider to be more neutral accents or foreign accents. And um, I remember when I posted an article on the English blog, it's not from the English blog, but I shared it from another site where it said that the Oxford or an editor from the Oxford Dictionary considered Filipino English to be legitimate and Filipino people became so excited. But you don't need to be told by some outside source that your version of the English language is legitimate. As long as you can be understood by other speakers of the language, then your accent is perfectly fine and acceptable. So before we go, don't forget that we provide customized lesson plan making services and curriculum planning. We also offer life and career coaching sessions and we produce weekly blog and blog content related to ESL education every week. Make sure you don't miss anything by sending us a message at www.theenglishblog.com and be sure to subscribe to our website for exciting offers and updates. Be sure to follow us on social media. We are on Facebook. Our name is The English Blog. On Instagram, we are the underscore English underscore blog. On LinkedIn, we are The English Blog. On YouTube, you can find us by searching The English Vlog with a V. And lastly, you can also find us on Twitter, The English Vlog One. So be sure to like, follow, share, and subscribe um, to us on social media, and we'd be very excited to see you. And as we conclude today's episode, we'd like to hear from you from the comments section of this video. Share with us your thoughts. What do you guys think about teaching proper accent and pronunciation? Or you, do you have any best practices you could share with other learners out there? And thank you once again for joining us. My name is Adrian. I'm Christine. And I'm PJ. And we are the English Blog, a blog of English teachers by English teachers and for English teachers. Until next time, guys, stay safe, happy, and keep learning. Bye.